good. Um, well, hey, we we're gonna kick this off, um, but just saying welcome to our our guest here. We have Sergi, uh, GM sir. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us. How are you doing today? Hey guys, great to be here. I'm doing good. How are you? Yeah, doing doing really well. Thank you. You doing really well. Um, really, really pleasured and honored just to have you with us here. Yeah, and I believe we have Ian as well uh, on the Axler account joining in too. Ian, yeah, how are you I'll doing, do. sir? Good, good. I'm doing well. How about yourself? Yeah, doing great, doing great. Uh, on the Leaf account today, it's me <laughs> speaking, community manager here. But we do have our uh, amazing hosts, researchers, threaded doors with us, Arjun and Mark. Um, we're excited to kick this one off, actually. It's our third one in our AMB series. And I must say that our community has been really excited uh, to have you guys with us. So thanks again for being here. Um, before we kick off, I just want to ask Arjun and Mark if they, if they are ready um, to kick this one off just yet with their microphones. They're going to give me a thumbs up just now. Um, but maybe in the meantime, because we all really love to know, maybe you can give us the TLDR on just exactly what XLR is and um, break that down for us. Yeah, for sure. Um, high level, Axler is a decentralized uh, cross-chain uh, communication network. So we're focusing on delivering secure cross-chain communication for Web3. What that means is that um, underneath it, there is a decentralized protocol and the network that's responsible for cross-chain message uh, routing and delivery. And on top of it, we have a very simple SDK and an API that any developer can use to make their applications uh, chain agnostic and go cross-chain. So that's a very brief summary. Yeah, great. Thanks for thanks for sharing that summary um, with us. You know, we all all about all things aggregation, abstraction, and cross-chain narrative. But what would be interesting for us, you know, in the community, just to know you guys a bit better uh, from Axelar, maybe you can also let us know uh, how you got to be involved with the project, what your roles are, and the role that you play. Sure. I mean, high level, uh, kind of my background is uh, distributed systems and cryptography. Uh, originally, you know, I did PhD at MIT and then afterwards uh, worked on the Algorand protocol to, to help uh, design and take it to the market. Um, you know, and subsequently after launching Algorand, saw this problem of cross-chain communication come up over and over again, where different chains wanted to talk to one another Developers wanted to build on the best chain for their needs, but still leverage cross-chain composability, uh, composability and liquidity, right? And so we realized that, you know, cross-chain is going to be an important problem to solve. Um, and it's a very hard technical problem to solve, you know, I'm sure you guys know. And, um, you know, we decided to focus on that uh, full time. And, uh, yeah, you know, been running this for about two years now. Um, we launched the network. About uh, you know seven months ago, we did 1.3 billion in cross-chain volume. 24 networks have gone live on the network, and uh, you know hundreds of applications that are building around the stack right now. Um, yeah, this is uh, kind of how we got here. Yeah, that's that's very impressive just to see the expansion that's taken place and how much is being built upon. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna hand this one over to Arjun. Now he's he he's prepared some 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 great questions here for us. Um, Arjun, over to you, sir. Yeah, hey guys. Uh, so good to have you here. We love Axelar team, and uh, it was one of the bridges that we covered in our AMB series. How did you guys like the framework? Any any views on that before we move into Axelar specific details? You mean like the the blog post and like the comparison matrix? Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I thought this was one of the best, um, thought thoughtfully done, you know, comparisons and evaluation frameworks. And uh, I think it's it it's great to see, you know, you guys put a um a lot of thought into this. I understand, you know, what's going on behind the scenes and a lot of these protocols. There's definitely, you know, a lot of um, noise 
is um, there's definitely a lot of complexity. And I think thinking about how do we, you know, simplify it, digest it and explain it to developers, right, in an easy way, I think it's, it, it's, it's incredibly important to, for us to continue, continue building. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, so that's awesome. Thank you. And uh, so let's let's dive deep into Axela. Can you maybe tell us a bit more about your team and your journey uh, till now? And what motivated you to build an AMB? Yeah, um, I mean, our journey, right, is that kind of originally, even when we started with Axela, um, we, we had this goal in mind where as a developer, you know, you shouldn't really be locked in into one chain, right? And um, be able to build on any chain you want and still have global composability and liquidity distribution channels, right? So how do you do this? Um, things like token transfers is something where a lot of the people started their kind of a, you know, bridging ideas from and, and they're, they're great. And, you know, value transfer is an important use case of cross-chain communication. However, um, we look beyond that and ask, you know, question, how do we deliver seamless one-click cross-chain experience, right? And the answer um, to do that lies in, you know, general message passing and uh, um, that can automate a lot of the cross-chain activity um, or movement behind the scenes for the users and, um, you know, allow us to kind of program the application applications that spawn multiple blockchain and ecosystems while users only interact with any of these applications and click from their wallets, right? So things like general message passing, the concept of bringing kind of program to the assets are something, you know, we've been working on and, um, you know, kind of develop as, as, as a part of the, the core stack. And, and again, like our goal is to just simplify the developer experience and at the same time, solve the user points um, that, um, you know, that users have today with um, fragmented like liquidity, right? Uh, multiple, multiple wallet hopping, like paying gas fees in multiple chains and, and, and all that. And, um, you know, so today uh, the general message passing is live on the network. You know, it's, it's been live across uh, many VM chains like, you know, Ethereum, Moonbeam, uh, you know, Polygon, Avalanche, and so on and so forth. Um, we're also connected uh, with Cosmos ecosystem quite well. So we're seeing a lot of asset transfer traffic between um, Cosmos uh, applications and uh, other chains uh, as most of the, you know, one of the big as well. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of continuing to, you know, expand and scale from here. Yeah, and to just keep this high level for the first part of this, uh, Twitter Spaces, um, kind of let's situate Axelar into the total A and B space. Um, so, like, what issue do you think that Axelar is solving in the interop industry? And, like, how does Axelar solve this um, in general? Yeah, on a high level, you know, I think a lot of the protocols that you see in the space, they're highly um, kind of centralized, right, or federated. So you have protocols that have a, a very strong trust, uh, trustness assumptions, right, uh, where only a few nodes kind of run the, the whole protocol for, for moving assets um, A to B. And um, as a result, you've seen a lot of compromise in the space, right? So these nodes that compromise, they, they run with hot, you know, live keys. So they're easy to, uh, tar targets for attacks. And so Axel is the only protocol that's based on decentralized and, um, you know, robust proof of stake technology that can spawn and connect multiple different ecosystems, right? So everything else that you see out there is either centralized or it works for specific ecosystems like like IBC, for instance, that works, you know, quite well within the Cosmos ecosystem, but, uh, um, you know, uh, very hard to scale outside of it. So that's point number one. It's kind of security and decentralization of the network and the protocol itself. The second piece is um, 
is the fourth layer itself functionalities that we'll provide, right? So Acceler is a blockchain. So meaning that we can actually program a lot of interesting functionality on the chain itself to deliver the superior interoperability experience. So two examples of that, one would be kind of many-to-many -many routing functionality, right? So, so any new network that's interconnected through the Axel protocol is automatically connected with all the other networks that have been previously connected, right? So what that means is that you have very, very strong compounding effects where um, you know liquidity can flow seamlessly, messages can flow seamlessly, and developers don't don't have to integrate other one-off protocols to make you know pairwise connections. So so a lot of the stuff that you've seen has been completely pairwise, but you can't scale everything in a pairwise way, right? You're going to end up with a lot lots of lots of number of connections, you know, quadratic number of connections, and so this kind of many-to-many -many functionality that you can scale. A, a lot more efficiently. Um, and then the second aspect that comes really, really handy when you have sort of a blockchain functionality for doing interoperability is that you can put logic or programs on the network itself, right? So one example of this is this notion of deposit address that we have. And the idea is there is that the network can be intelligent to understand where a certain assets needs to go from one chain to another. And, uh, you know, the user doesn't have to interact with multiple different chains, pay gas on multiple networks, and, you know, can, can do their transfers, like, directly from any wallet of their choosing, like centralized exchange or a dumb wallet. Um, and, and what allows us to do this very, very cost effectively is because, again, like, this functionality is put on the Axler, you know, sort of blockchain itself that, that makes it... Um, that makes it very, very efficient for um, for the users. I think you briefly mentioned that uh, Axla uses IBC, right? And and we know IBC is considered like one of the safest uh, interop protocols within the Cosmos ecosystem. So maybe can you shed some light for our listeners why IBC? is not extensible beyond the Cosmos ecosystem and how IBC is really helping Axelar to scale. Yeah, so I mean, Axelar, you know, again, like our goal was to build like an interoperable transport layer, right? And the network that has these properties beyond how does, you know, A connect to B. I think A connecting to B, it's a question of how do you make that pairwise channel to be as secure as possible, right? And IBC, you know, is sort of, uh, IBC model is the ideal model. We have this notion of light clients that are parsed between, uh, passed between two ch different chains and uh, the chains can verify each other's consensus mechanisms, right? So um, very good model if you want to uh, connect A to B, right? So, and, and it's great. The challenge of scaling that across um, different ecosystems is that these light clients are actually very expensive to produce from the engineering side, um, and they're also very expensive to verify in other languages, right? So if I have a light client in, um, you know, Go language, and I need to write an implementation of it in Solidity, then it's a you know it's a it's a engineering effort. It also would end up in quite a lot of gas costs for the users, um, and um, then you put in this like very very heavy dependency on this um, between between the two chains. If your light clients is upgraded, then you're gonna have to rewrite that logic in you know all the different languages that you're trying to bridge. So it's so so it is a great model, um, but it is a very hard practically uh, um, to scale model. But I think, you know, we should continue working towards as much as we can. Um, but this is a question of how does A connect to B, right? Like, um, so Axelar uses IBC on the back end, right? We connect um, a lot of different Cosmos chains, including like Cosmos Hub, including Osmosis, including, you know, Secret Network, Kajira, and so on and so forth. Um, but then beyond that, again, how do you how do you provide this like many-to-many -many sort of routing and transport 
with functionality and you know packet and message translation across all of these different ecosystems and that's where we rely on other you know techniques and protocols that are baked at the at the network layer right so when a message as an example goes from osmosis to ethereum that message actually gets translated by the actual blockchain so that the ibc packet format can now be you know, um, parsed at the Ethereum blockchain and the message can execute on Ethereum and, and the other way around, right? When you send it a message from an Ethereum chain to um, to um, a Cosmos chain, then first it's an Ethereum transaction that's generated, then the, the Axel will help you translate that message into a Cosmos packet and an IBC packet and then route it out to you know, osmosis as an, as an example, and then execute it there. So um, yeah, and this is what we call as uh, kind of many-to-many -many routing and translation functionality at the at the network layer, and will translate between IBC. You know, if other protocols become you know um, popular or available, like we'll integrate them all. Um, kind of the more trustless and the more um, secure these pairwise connections are, the better. Um, but interoperability goes kind of uh, way beyond that to deliver these user experiences that we have to work on. Perfect. I think that's um, an awesome time to kind of segue into one of our favorite things where you've been asking all of these different types of A and Bs um, in this Twitter spaces, uh, which is to describe the transaction lifecycle of a transaction going through Axelar and maybe hit the different entities um, that are major players within the Axelar ecosystem um, and just kind of walk the uh, listener through that because I know we wrote it up, y'all have great documentation on it, but sometimes we have auditory listeners who uh, we're hoping this podcast will be good for. Yep, for sure. So Describe the flow, maybe let me um, start with uh, flow uh, EVM based chains, right? Because I think here, and then you know, we can talk about how does like IBC chains integrate with this. Um, so, on Ethereum chains, we have this notion of a gateway, okay? And a gateway you can think of it as a router um, that your applications from that chain can send and receive messages from, right? So, uh, think of it like at home, you have you know, a router, right? And uh, Whenever you're connecting from your home laptop to the internet, your messages are first sent to that router. And then there's all kinds of infrastructure that takes those messages and then delivers them to the destination networks. So it's the same way here. The gateway is a smart contract that's deployed on different chains. And then your applications can send the messages to the gateway, right? And then afterwards, once the message is sent to the gateway, two things happen. A, anybody can send a message and relay to the Axelar network. Right? Um, relay it and then ask the network to validate it. Okay. What the network validators do is that they run this kind of consensus protocol um, that uses things like quadratic voting right, um, to agree on the state of transaction on the source chain. So it's a decentralized protocol. Anybody can run it. Anybody can be a validator. Assuming the threshold weighted by this quadratic voting rule is reached, the validators determine that the message from the source chain is you know, legitimate. And then subsequently, they sign a message um, using kind of multi-party cryptography techniques that can be relayed and posted on the destination gateway. right? And so in this case, if you are, let's say, calling from one smart contract on the source chain, another smart contract on the destination chain, your message, anybody picks that up, relays it to the Axel network, Axel network validators, vote on it, finalize it, produce a message that corresponds to your source chain message that, again, can be relayed by anybody posted on the destination gateway, and that subsequently calls your contract. Um, and your contract could be, you know, a mint operation uh, or NFT token transfer or, you know, cross-chain loan or whatever that is. And then you can display the result of that transaction to the user, right? So that's the 
end-to-end -end flow uh, between the gateways, the axle networks, and kind of relayers in the middle doing the job of, of just posting messages from one network to the other. Was that was that clear? Yes, that was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Succinct, too. That was like two minutes. We should cut that and post that on Twitter for everyone to, to get that little snippet for sure. Um, but okay, so earlier you mentioned uh, that one of Axelar's main selling points is that it is decentralized. And I would, assu I would assume that you were uh, referencing the validator set, uh, which is kind of the main uh, instance in uh, confirming transactions from change chain in Axelar. Um, can you define exactly by decentralization um, and how you um, are decentralizing the network now and what your plans are to decentralize it going forward? Yeah, great question, right? So essentially, um, every time you're doing cross-chain, um, like you guys probably know, there are two models, right? Uh, there is a model of these life client validation and, again, like for validation between point A and B, I think this light client model, like IBC is what we should strive towards. But if you don't have a light client available connection, then everything else is pretty much becomes externally validated logic, right? And when I say externally validated, the question you ask, who is responsible for um, validating that the message has been issued on the source chain and authorizing this message on the destination chain. What does that protocol look like? How many entities can run this protocol? What does the you know code behind it look like? Uh, who can propose change on and so forth, right? And so Axelar gonna be in the blockchain that it has this you know uh, validator set being based on proof of stake technology. So it's powered by Tendermint consensus. Anybody can join the protocol, participate as a validator. Anybody can send those transactions. Anybody can put a governance proposal to improve the protocol. We actually had like a pretty interesting PR this morning that came um, from the community, which, which was amazing to see. Um, and uh, you know, anybody can continue you know, pointing out problems with it if there are any, right? Or continue improving it with it. Um, and so this is what I really mean by a decentralized. It's, uh, um, the network is decentralized, so you have a large validator set. Participation on the network is open and permissionless, and the technology itself is open and permissionless. So anybody can participate, anybody can use it, anybody can make a new, you know, new connection. And I think that's what we really should strike forward. That has proven to achieve uh, strong security guarantees. At the end of the day, is kind of a security by um, community participation participation and decentralization. That's, that's awesome. That's great to know. And I think uh, one of the things that bridges in general really need to take care of is security and decentralization kind of goes hand in hand, right? And last week we saw the BNB hack. Uh, so I just want to ask you, like, how, what's Axla's approach towards security? Like, how do you guys ensure that the architecture is sound and the user's funds are always secure? No, that's a, an amazing question. Um, so first, I guess I would I would send some folks to our blog. Um, you know, we recently wrote an article, how to think about security on the Axel network. Um, so if you go to axel.network uh, forward slash blog, um, there is a, a post on security. So check that out. Um, but essentially, it comes down to three layers, as I like to think about it. A, there is a design. Right? So how do you start with the architecture that's secure from the start, which is decentralized, right? Allows anybody to contribute to the security of the network um, and uh, participate and keep on improving it. So that's kind of the design aspects of it. Second one is engineering. Right. Um, how do you build um, various practices in your engineering process to keep on improving the security of the network overall? Right. Things like keeping the design as simple as possible, decoupling you know fee market from the validation uh, validation logic, uh, making sure your protocol you know is not specific to one or two applications, but can really be kind of as generic 
generic as possible and as simple as possible at the same time. So those are all engineering questions you have to think about. Um, things like audits, right? Um, so to date, we have done, done, I think, over 27 audits and all of them, you know, publicly available. You can look at the GitHub. Um, we run a bug bounty for over 2 million. Um, that again, anybody can go and participate and um, any issues and get rewards for them. Um, so that's the aspect of it, right? Very robust practices, simplicity at the core, making sure the logic that should not be a part of the consensus is not a part of consensus and go somewhere else, um, right? And the kind of audits and rigorous feedback and testing that we have put into this. And then the third layer of security is what I call application specific add-ons, right? And so what I mean by this are things like, you know, for asset transfers, we have this notion of rate limits, right? So um, we bound how much uh, can be transferred through the gateway uh, per given interval. And um, that rate limit effectively means that if the network is compromised, right? So if there's like a bug at the, you know, at the network layer, then the adversary will be limited to how much they can, you know, they can withdraw from, from this gateway. So things like with the Binance chain hack or things like that, um, you know, they should be capped, right? Because like there's no re reason anybody would transfer, um, you know, half a billion worth of value um, in a single, you know, transaction. Okay, if they have, if those things happen, then, you know, you can you can deal with them properly, but uh, for most traffic, um, you know, you can upper bound um, how much value you want to transfer, and then you know these things like rate limits are then and enforced on it. Um, and then other types of application specific add-ons is what we're working with with developers, right? Um, so if I'm building a cross-chain market making uh, protocol, if I'm building a cross-chain borrowing and lending protocol, again, what are the additional smart contract features that I can add, uh, maybe using Axler, maybe having some extra validated nodes on the side or putting some of these rate limits in my application logic to make sure I have extra layers of redundancy and uh, robustness, right? So this is the third layer of security. It's, it's complex, right? It's, uh, it's not an easy thing. Nothing is, uh, you know, sort of uh, bulletproof, but I do think if you have the robust design that you start with and decentralize if you have good engineering practices and then you have um you know strong application add-ons then then you can mitigate the risks and you can actually make the um the um the cross-chain ecosystem be be safe uh and the you know uh reliable for the end users Yeah, I'm really glad you hit on the rate limit functionality. We were definitely going to ask a question about that, but uh, you, you uh, front ran us. Um, so another thing that we uh, kind of in our A and B is that we believe that Axlar has the ability to freeze funds in the event of a black swan event. Um, would you like to extrapolate on that concept? Um, um, so Axler, yeah, it's um, it's not an ability to freeze funds, but it's an ability to say rate limits, I think, to zero <laughs> effectively, right? Uh, practically pausing it. And it's not sort of the Axler. It's a kind of a decentralized, you know, kind of offline um, governance committee that can do these things um, in a case of an attack or a case of, a, you know, an emergency um, I think it'd be put in place and uh, kind of a cap in some of the, um, you know, some of the damages. Um, you know, again, can this protocol be done better and more secure? Probably. But I do think kind of given what we're seeing in the space, it was said this kind of, you know, rate limits to, to effectively zero in the case of a worst case, case um, you know, attack is something I think, at least for now, is practical um and then you know we can work towards making the whole process of invoking that even more um decentralized right so for instance um maybe on the excel network you can vote quickly to to do those things right and maybe like a smaller threshold of communities will have to come on chain and vote to um to invoke some of these protocols um, but i do think that that um you know some type of um 
safety mechanisms, right? That application specific is 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 actually quite needed, not just for the bridging space, but in general for even DeFi, right? Uh, we seen wallets get hacked. We're seeing uh, DeFi protocol gets hacked. So I, I think of these security add-ons as almost like firewalls, right? Which so far in the industry, we haven't really touched too much, but you can make a firewall, right? That limits your input and output functionality. And then maybe you have like an offline pro- process or an online process to, to invoke some of those or modify some of those like for- or firewall rules. Uh, firewalls. Do you actually want to go a little bit deeper into that firewalls concept? Uh, sure. I haven't really heard that concept in the in the bridge space often. Yeah. So the the, the basic idea, right, um, is you know in the traditional kind of internet, right? Um, what are the properties that that you have? Anybody can talk to anyone, and then you figure out when you receive you know a message. Uh, at your application, whether or not that message should be executed by your application, right? To figure out whether or not the message should be executed by application, you can do all kinds of filtering before even executing the message, right? And that filtering is usually done by, by like network layer firewalls, right? Or application layer firewalls or, you know, operating system layer firewalls and, and concepts like that. And so I think blockchain space we haven't really explored uh, explored this too much um so but it's something i've been thinking about over the last couple of weeks where how can we create this notion of an application specific set of contracts firewall contracts for now that would filter the messages coming in and out of the application and perform additional security checks on those messages right and so those checks could be you know, did I reach my rate limit or is my destination contract uh, um, authorized or is the call coming from a contract authorized and things like that. So those are all the checks that you can perform. I think those checks should be done outside of the application logic, like in a separate contract. And then you, this contract would effectively filter the messages, authorize the ones that are valid, deny the ones that are um, you know, invalid, and then talk with the application contracts directly. Um, and so any time you want to talk to the application, you actually have to go through this sort of firewall contract. And, uh, um, you know, and I, like I said, like you can define whether or not you want to make it immutable or you want to make some type of, um, you know, upgrade protocol to it that's going to have to the application logic itself. Um, but I think that would be quite interesting. I think that would allow us to decouple a lot of the, um, security um, issues into a separate component that needs to be hardened and that needs to be bulletproof. And the application logic, um, you know, can still do the same checks, but this will be like an additional layer. Um, not explored in the space, but I would love to see things like this happen over the next, uh, you know, year or so. I think uh, another way Axelar is also adding up on security is through the AXL token and token economics, right? So I think you mentioned uh, role of the token can also be uh, like the token can also play a great role in kind of decentralizing the network and also enhance the security, basically economically. So maybe do you? I want to share your experience, like, uh, first of all, launching a token in a bear market and then uh, expanding upon how the AXL token will kind of help uh, secure the network. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, so we launched the uh, the token a couple of weeks ago behind the Axler network and the protocol. You know, it's now public. Anybody can, can use it, um, you know, delegate to the validators, like, and rewards and the token has similar functions as it has in other uh proof of stake networks right so you use it to pay gas on the on the network itself and to pay for the transaction fees and i'll come back to that in a second you use it for securing the network right so the validators get delegation of the token from the users 
they participate in this cross-chain uh, consensus protocol and they earn rewards for, for doing that, right? And validators that do a better job, you usually get more delegations, right? And so they have more incentives to continue performing well and continue securing their nodes and, uh, you know, operate in the network uh, in a reliable way. Um, and then you use it for governance, right? Again, like things like software upgrades, uh, proposals, they have to go through a voting protocol by, um, by the community. And, uh, you know, this makes sure that the network itself and the protocol uh, goes through additional layers of, of uh, checks, right, and balances and where the community votes on it and the, the validators have to opt in into participating in any type of upgrades. Um, so it plays a very, very important role. And underneath all of this, um, kind of when I mentioned, um, is that, you know, you use the actual token every time you go cross-chain. Um, but the beauty of how we architected the network is that as a user, you actually never touch it when you're, uh, when you execute in cross-chain transactions, right? So what that means is that as a user, you execute and you pay gas on the source chain in one click, but then we have a set of services and relayers that take that gas, convert it to pay like gas on Axel, and then convert it to pay on the destination chain uh, and execute the transactions for the user on Axel on the destination chain to do the validation and, and execution, right? Uh, and um, so the token is, is, is kind of continuing to be used as a utility to help secure the network. Um, but the users never uh, directly interact with it, which I think is actually, you know, really powerful um, for um, for continuing the distribution and integrations of the network. Beautiful. Um, and AXL, I think it launched about a week and a half ago. So congrats on that launch. By the way, that was that was a big deal for anyone that pays attention to the space. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen our launch video, I think that's one thing that I'll encourage you to uh, to watch. Where we try to reference um, and try to think about, you know, what is the current state of the blockchain, and uh, you know, kind of a how how we should think about it. And I think it's it's very very early, right? And I think like some analogies we make there are pretty spot on of um, of how people use the internet in the early days. Yeah, one of the, one of the favorite things about your documentation is how many analogies you use towards early internet uh, to where like you know even the boomers can understand it, which is which is great. We need more boomers getting in this space because uh, they're serious instead of all those young degenerates over here. Um, but speaking of the on that oh, actually. Oh, Sorry, yeah, one, one thing just to, to mention, right? I think one thing that I find very, very interesting when you talk about cross-chain in general is that a lot of, like, Web3 native developers, they're not familiar with the concept of, like, asynchronous communication, right? <laughs> like, people that grew up with Solidity, right, and, like, with Solana, all these different chains, they understand what happens when a transaction, you know, is submitted on a single chain and gets reverted or executed. Area, right? But when you talk about cross-chain and multiple, you know, networks or applications talking to one another, you do have to have asynchronous communication. You do have to think about, about like fallbacks and, you know, um, and your protocol has to be adjusted for those things. And I think, yeah, like you said, like the, um, you know, the, the traditional Web2 Web community understands this at the core because that's how Web2 works. But I think Web3 community is a little less familiar with which i which i always find um you know super super fascinating and so it's good to educate them on these new kind of programming models there we go um okay so we're about half, halfway through our time here we're, we're speeding speeding past this twitter spaces um and so we want to go through um one of the things that we talk about all the time at lefi is how trust is a spectrum uh, so, like the meme in the whole blockchain space is that decentralization is a spectrum, and you know you can have all your Twitter threads and debates about you know which blockchains are decentralized. Now, in the bridging space, we have all of these debates over what bridges are actually trustless, and what we mean by trustless is that um, at the baseline of all bridging is that you pretty much have two, you know, 
independent blockchains trying to talk to each other. Um, and pretty much anything that is not the native validators of blockchains talking directly to each other, anything built on a, in any bridge that on top of that level is an additional trust assumption. And so we like to just talk about trust assumptions all the time. Um, and one of the sections in our A and B for every single bridge is trust assumptions. Um, and so anyone, anytime we have someone on Twitter spaces, uh, I would like to give Arjun the floor to uh, maybe throw a trust assumption that we think might be um, a bit of an issue or maybe not an issue, but uh, something that is, is sticky um, and, and let you debate with Arjun. So Arjun, I'll clear out and uh, uh, let, you, let you go. I think before probably going into specifics, I would probably like to ask you, what, what is your definition of trustless? Like, what do you think means, uh, what do you think people mean by like calling a project trustless? Yeah, no, great that you asked that, right? So, um, you know, my, my background is a cryptography, right? And I think the, the concept of trustless there actually is very, very rigorously defined, which is a notion of, um, you know, not having things like complexity assumptions or any type of assumptions whatsoever, right? Um, the reality is that whatever we call trustless in the blockchain is full of assumptions, okay? Like there is no such thing as trustless blockchain implementation or application. We are relying on things like cryptography, like things like good implementations of cryptography. We are relying on hash functions and that the hash functions don't have collisions. <laughs> We are a little relying on economic assumptions under, under, underneath this, right? So even if my chain talks to your chain, I'm relying that there is economic security that's your chain guarantees that's not affected and it's not broken so that when I read a packet from your chain, I can actually validate it, right? So that's an economic assumption um, on, um, on, on, on trust. And uh, there is an assumption about code being correctly executed, right? Or even written. Whenever we're talking about even two chains directly talking to one another, I think what you call is like trustless. But the reality is that the light client verifications often are incredibly complex, right? And then you're assuming actually that those implementations are written correctly you know, solidity or even the consensus layer itself and they don't have bugs. Um, and they, those may end up being very complex and very, um, very limitations to verify, right? So, um, yeah, so I guess, you know, you know uh, I don't think we can define trustless in the blockchain space. I don't think we can define trustless in the interoperability. Um, and so we can only refer on the spectrum of assumptions that we make then we do have to compare them one to one to another. Um, and actually, I, I think actually one thing that I would like to propose in general as an industry is to, instead of talking about trustless, I think really talking about trusted computing base of any protocol or any integration, right? And the trusted computing base is usually things like how many lines of code do you have that executes something, right? Um, and what is the complexity of of those lines of codes that need to be and you know what other assumptions go along the way um, as you execute in those um, those um, those lines of code so I think that would be a lot more um, you know rigorous if we can go down that path then then talk about like trustless versus not I think uh, you put up like great points on how we should probably uh, look at trustless differently and maybe we should like collaborate on a research piece because i would love to learn from you yeah no absolutely would love to get into that and i think we, we have to do better like as an industry overall right like to define these things and make it um more accessible for others to, to parse as well okay so uh specific to axla i think you have 50 validators right now and if i'm not wrong around 49 uh, are active. So how do you uh, ensure uptime for all of these validators? Like, are there any slashing mechanisms or any other measures? 
Yeah, so the, the Excel consensus follows like a standard uh, proof of stake consensus, right? Where um, there are rewards for the validators to participate in it and support, you know, as many chains and integrations. And then there are penalties, right, for misbehaving or losing uptime um, and, um, you know, with double signing like on a block and things like that. Um, I think the interesting thing to note is that while the consensus itself follows the standard, stake model where it's weighted by stake the cross-chain functionality actually voted based on a kind of quadratic voting rule right and so what that means is that practically if, if validator accumulates you know a lot of stake then their power in the cross-chain functionalities will still be kind of limited as a function of uh, as a square root function on their vote um, and so that allows us to keep the base layer, you know, very standard and very um, robust, um, but continue kind of decentralizing the um, the, the cross-chain validation to be done by by more and more validators than just just like that uh, kind of the voting power is distributed. Uh, you know, fairly across the validator set and not um, like 20 validators don't hold all the voting power. So is that where uh, essentially quadratic voting comes in? Yep. So I, I think maybe a um, probably like the snapshot that you guys had was before the token was released, right? So there was, um, you know, mostly like delegation from the from the stake that was was done. But I think since then, since the last couple of weeks, since the token has been live, you know, I'm looking at the dashboard right now. We have, um, you know, top, um, yeah, kind of a 36 validators have uh, 1% or more. Um, and then beyond that, um, like you said, this quadratic voting rules apply, right? So if validator has you know, um, some, some voting power and number of coins in the protocol, their vote um, in the cross activity is, is then reduced as a square root function of those votes. So that means for large validators, they actually vote both with less power and smaller validators vote with more power, right? And that was, that was precisely to address these, um, you know, these types of practical issues that we're seeing in proof of, uh, proof of stake network. Um, so hopefully now with token being live um, and widely distributed, will continue increasing the validator set. Um, so we actually have plans to, you know, increase from 50. Now, now it's a parameter, right? So we can change it to 75. We can make sure the network is robust and like, you know, all the no performance issues. We can continue improving to 100 and then beyond that. And, and so we're going to keep it rolling in that. And hopefully the, the, the user will support us as well, smaller validators and delegate to them. But if not, again, things like quadratic voting rules apply to to help kind of a um create a more more even distribution beautiful you answered my question about uh when you guys will be adding more validators to the set excited about that um so i think we have about 15 minutes left um and this is the time we usually uh get a and b specific um and ask about Axelar and the Axelar ecosystem. Um, and then my favorite question I get to pose um, is where does Axelar sit in the AMB world? And do you believe this is a one bridge to rule them all type of environment? Or do you see AMB, I mean, do you see Axelar being one solution in a wide variety of interoperability networks? Yeah, no, great question. So here, here's the bottom line, and I, I'm somewhat convinced that um, I think the message semantics for cross-chain protocol need to be decoupled from the validation and the network layer and routing and everything else. Okay, when we say message semantics, we mean what is the packet format that application on chain A with an application on chain B. Okay. That packet format, frankly, is incredibly simple. Okay, we have one our, our version. Other protocols have their versions, but it all comes down to, I want to go from chain A to a chain B. This is my payload. Here are all the other fields that I need to do that. Okay, that's 
like TCP IP type of packet. It's packet semantics. We should all agree on it, okay? And we should all use the same. Why? Because for the applications, they're getting fed up with different packet formats. They're getting fed up with different message formats and they have to think about, you know, oh, what happens if I implement this abstraction then I have to switch to this other abstraction. But they're all, all doing the same things, right? Like they're all like, you know, uh, kind of detail. You can agree on those details and you can agree on the length of those fields. And so that's what I call like message semantics packet format, um, which is a layer above that integrates with applications. It, it will get converged um, to, to, to one, one, one standard, whatever that looks like, uh, shape and form. Beyond that, though, then you have to go back and think about, okay, then how do I actually, what is the network that facilitates the delivery of those messages, right? And you can talk about, you know, trustless implementations between chain A and chain chain B, um, you can talk about IBC clients, you can talk about, you know, ZK technology and whatever. And so that's a layer for of what I call as a validation, right? Validation between A and B, what is the best way to make, make that validation happen, right? And we should continue improving on that. It should be, it should have as few assumptions as possible, but it also needs to be simple. It also needs to be well understood, it has to have, you know, rates and, and balances in place and things like that. So that's a validation layer A to B. Beyond that is what I call is a network layer, right? As, as, which is really what actual network is trying to do, which is how do I do many to many routing? How do I add new networks in a famous way? How do I do path discovery? How do I do network discovery? How do I do message translation from one ecosystem to another when it needs to go. So, so that's a network layer, right? And I think on the network layer, um, you know, we certainly hope to be kind of a, you know, a, a big provider of these functionalities. You know, maybe there will be other networks down the line as well. Uh, we'll see. Um, you know, I think right now at the network layer, like with the most robust guarantees, uh, and, uh, you know, the layers above it, like the validation, the message semantics, um, again, um, validation, I think we should continue improving in the industry. I do think we're going to see those validation layers just being improved over the years, right? So today it's A, maybe it's external validation, maybe it's zero knowledge, it's more available and more easily accessible. Um, maybe it's, um, you know, direct light clients you have, the better we can make those individual the better it is for everybody. And then on top of it, the message semantics, we should standardize, we should agree, we should move on because that's the only way for the developers to actually use these cross-chain protocols without getting fed up. Okay, and speaking of those developers, what is already being built on Axelar and what do you hope to see be built on Axelar in the coming months and years? Yeah, I mean, a lot of early use cases, right, are um, around um, asset transfers, um, which was a kind of early go-to-market for us. Um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing things like Osmosis integrating with Axler to provide indirect deposits from, you know, different systems, or things like use directly to their chain. We're seeing um, cross-chain payment networks like Square, with. We're seeing cross-chain uh, borrowing and lending functionality like uh, Prime pro Protocol. Um, we're seeing a lot of NFT use cases and um, you know things like, like that are continuing um, to happen. What I would like to see more of are things like universal cross-chain wallets. I think I would like to see. Um, I've seen a few solutions and I, I, I think I've seen a few protocols. I do think there is more thinking to be done there. Um, I do want to see more kind of a privacy preserving um, protocols being built as well. So think about it like as a cross chain, um, you know, privacy preserving coin or stable coin. I think things like that would be quite interesting. I think messaging um, is an important uh, uh, protocol as well that I would like to see. Um, so yeah, I would say um, I, I would say overall though, here's here's how I think about it. What we're building with Axel is like core connectivity 
roads and, 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 and you know, airplanes, right, and the air traffic control system. On top of it, you can think about what is it my specific airplane needs to look like to transfer the payload most efficiently from a specific, you know, source to a destination, right? And those are what I call as application-specific protocols. Um, internet is structured the same way as where you have routing and uh, kind of validation protocols are decoupled from application-specific payload protocols. And I think I would like to see more of those application-specific protocols, um, you know, think about like HTTPS of the world um, to make the, the lives of developers um, easier. And I think we, we're starting to see those building blocks either around messaging or payments, um, you know, or kind of cross-chain uh, deposits. I think they're becoming more and more clear now. Sure. You guys really are the pros at uh, giving analogies, and it's really great to hear just uh, what your thoughts are on what could be built on, on top of XLR and what that would look like in the near future, just casting some vision um, in the cross-chain community. We all love something to look forward to, just to hear from projects just about their vision and what journey they're wanting to take us on, right? So um, as we head to the end of our spaces, one question that uh, community members are really keen on just really knowing the answer to is what's coming ahead maybe already planned on the roadmap could be some alpha maybe something that you've been waiting to mention um but just to just to frame it better like could you just let us in on what's coming up in the next couple of quarters on your roadmap uh we'd really love to know yeah i mean uh, one thing uh, i would say definitely more chain integrations are coming live right so we, uh, we announced, uh, you know, work that we're doing with like Mistin Labs is one example. We're going to be announcing a few other integrations that we've been working on. So yeah, continue to scale the backend kind of transport layer, right, in the network to to allow more integrations, make more, be more permissionless than made, right, by the developers themselves, which, you know, I think will continue adding to the robustness and security of the protocol. Um, so that's one piece. I think the second thing that we very, very high level announced, but uh, you know, more details will be coming as well are things like we're doing with uh, you know, Circle and USDC, right? So Circle um, um, is working on their implementation of um, kind of a bridge protocol for USDC. And we're composing that with Axler general message passing and with the rest of the infrastructure to, to enable the build out of these seamless cross chain experiences. Um, and um, yeah, so that's something that, you know, uh, be on the lookout for. I think we have an interesting, um, you know, kind of content and uh, other things that will be that will be coming up. But um, I do think USDC, um, you know, integration with Axelet will be, will be really, really, really powerful. And um, I think the, the other things that we're trying to think more about, um, you know, and be on the lookout for the, for those things are things like we actually go about agreeing on some of these kind of layers of interoperability, right, or message semantics, and how do we talk about it as an industry? And um, yeah, we have um, some kind of a quite exciting news to around to that will be announcing around that to to help you know kind of shepherd the industry along in the in the, in the same direction. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Um, what I love about you guys is that you're always um, looking for problems to solve in, in the interop space, but also really providing some groundbreaking stuff. So we're really looking forward to the integrations that we have ahead and uh, the work that you're going to do at Circle. I don't know, but for, for, for us cross-chain nerds, um, that's stuff that's going to keep me up at night for sure. But hey, you've been a, you've been a really great guest um, on the space with us today. So thank you for all your insights and really just, you know, opening the door to all that is XLR. But before we go, um, I'd just like to give you the opportunity maybe to have some closing thoughts or anything else that you'd like to share. If not, that's okay. Because, man, we've really enjoyed this. But if so, now's the time to do it. Yeah, I think one thing that I would just note is uh, note that, um, you know, we are uh, running an accelerator program and a grants program um, for developers, right? So... Lawn Hash Ventures is somebody who we partner with to run an accelerator program for Axler. And so they're receiving applications right now. If you're looking to build in a space, go apply. 
and it actually goes through two streams where one stream is going to be going through the grant um, where we will work direct teams to give them you know some capital to help them get started uh, we are seriously and like we, we coach the teams we, we meet them we help them with fundraise right we help them think about market fit and we bring kind of industry experts to to give feedback as well and then the second stream is the accelerator program with non hash um, ventures as well, which I'm super excited about. And the guys, you know, have worked with um, with a lot of other um, uh, uh, great projects in the past. And so, as a developer, I think you know it's, it's just an oppor- in a exciting opportunity to build in the cross chain world. And I would encourage you to, to apply. Yeah. So any devs um, on the space today, like I really encourage you to just to apply for that. Uh, what I really like about what you mentioned was just the involvement and coaching um, that you guys as Axelo would have in that process as well. Well, from me, Jordan, the host of today's uh, space, it's been a real pleasure to host you guys, although I didn't say too much other than host the real stars, the Sergi Arjun and Mr. Mark Money Murdoch himself. Uh, so thank you for tuning in, everybody. This has been our third space in our arbitrary messaging bridges series. Make sure to check our AMB article um, and uh, you won't be disappointed. But that's all for us today. Thank you, Sergi, once again for joining. Arjun and Mark, you guys are legends. We'll see you all next time. Until next Thank time. you guys for having me. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.